And today we're going to talk about capacitors. We've already talked about capacitors. We've talked about their electric field, uh, that, that, you know, how to characterize that, how to um, look at that. We've used that electric field. And so now we're going to talk about them more as a circuit element and how we can charge them, how we can store energy in them, and use them for different purposes. And this is going to transition us from uh, what we've been talking about lately into talking more about circuits. And so a good example to start with is this one here. Uh, and so we've got a battery here. So a battery is uh, a device that maintains a potential difference. Uh, and that's basically what it does. And so you can think about if you open up a battery, there's like a positive side and a negative side. You can imagine that there's like a little conveyor belt. Uh, and what it does is it separates the charge. And so what it does is, you know, basically when you hook it up, charge will start to flow. And this thing separates charge. And so like in our case, we can imagine that it sort of moves electrons from the positive to the negative side and keeps up a potential difference. So this battery here has a potential difference of 3 volts. Uh, now, generally batteries are done this way by, by chemical reactions. Uh, for us, we don't necessarily care what's happening, but we're going to just treat the battery as something that maintains a potential difference. Um, and and so what I typically do is we'll just sort of call the bottom of the battery zero volts and the top uh, whatever the size of the battery is. So this is three volts. And so here we're connecting uh, two metal wires uh, to the ends of the three volt battery. And I want to know is what's going to be the potential difference uh, on these endpoints when we're done with this. So think about this or when it's had time to reach equilibrium. Uh, think about this and we'll talk about it in a second. Okay, so here's how I rationalize this. Uh, so I get 3 volts. How do we get that? Well, if there is a potential difference, a charge will feel a force. When you first hook up that wire, okay, there's going to be potential differences in the wire, and so charges, if they're there, will feel a force. Well, this is a metal, so it's got roughly an infinite number of free charges, and so therefore a conductor in equilibrium will be an equal potential. What that means is when I hook up this conductor to the battery, the charges will move until that conductor is all at the same potential. Because otherwise, if it wasn't, there would still be charges moving. And so that means every point on this wire here is 3 volts, and every point on this wire here is 0 volts. And so if you give it a few seconds, they'll reach equilibrium, right? And if you do that, it's, uh, it'll, there'll be equal potentials, and so the difference would be 3 volts. And we've, we've sort of talked about this too. Uh, so we talked about our conductor and electrostatic equilibrium. One key we said is that the electric field on it had to be zero. You know, if I'm a charge in the middle and I feel a force, I'm going to move. And, and conductors have an infinite number of charges. So they move and so that there's no electric field. Uh, well, if there's no electric field, uh, then the potential has to be zero as well, right? So the difference in the potential, so we have that equation, difference in potential is uh, electric field, you know, uh, ds, something like this. Well, if the electric field is zero, then this has to be zero at we as well. And so another way to sort of think about this is that, um, again, you can think about the conductor as having an interior that is all at the same potential. And so this brings us to our idea of a, of a capacitor. And a capacitor is really just the idea we've been describing, just a little bit uh, you know, set up to sort of maximize the amount of charge you can store. But it's really the same idea. And so what we do for a capacitor is here is my parallel plate capacitor. We sort of talked about this. You hook it up to a battery. Again, the battery is, is a, a, some sort of mechanism that maintains a potential difference. And so my favorite kind of battery is a car battery. So I'll just say this is a car battery. So the, the, the positive end is 12 volts. The negative end is zero. Now again, with a battery, you know, we've talked about how potential and height are similar. Like when you did mechanics problems, you could call your zero height to be anywhere. So you could technically call this to be your zero volts, and then this would be like negative 12 volts. Uh, you know, that's totally fine. You can do whatever you want, but, but I, I think this is sort of the way that makes sense more to me. Um, and so what's going to happen is when you first hook this up, all right, you've got this piece of metal, these sort of uh, essentially unlimited number of electrons. And so what's going to happen is over here, an electron will say, hey, there's a positive 12 volts. I'd like to get there, right? And another way to think about it is the electron says, hey, there's a positive, you know, some positive charges that need electrons. I want to go there. So the positive charge will zoom over to the 12 volts. And when it does that, it leaves behind a positive. This positive will then attract an electron from over here. This is basically like a whole bunch of extra electrons that will come over to here on that piece of the metal. And then you've sort of got one level of charge that has moved. Uh, and so technically it's the electron moving from here to here and then an electron coming from over to here uh, 
right? Um, uh, but that's uh, what happens to it. And essentially, this process keeps happening until you reach this point that charges no longer want to do this. Uh, and you can think, well, that's how do I know when that is? Well, the easiest way is to say, well, that's when this piece of metal becomes 12 volts. Um, and this one over here becomes zero volts. And so it's just another way to get at that exact situation we were just talking about. So basically, this electrons will be attracted over here until this gets to 12 volts and this gets to zero volts. And at this point, um, our capacitor will be fully charged. And it's unfortunate I put those numbers right on top of there. Um, and so this is where we get, you know, our picture that we've seen of a capacitor before. So now you've got some positive charge here an equal and opposite negative charge here. And so this is exactly what we described when we've been talking about capacitors to date. So essentially what happens is, you know, electrons are like moving from here to here. Uh, they do that sort of via the battery, but you can also sort of think it, uh, think about it that way as well. Um, and so what will happen is in this case with one uh, capacitor hooked up, we'll talk about cases where there's more than one capacitor. All right, what happens is we end up uh, working until the potential difference is the same as the battery. Um, and so let's move on. So in here we got a question from a student. Does a potential difference still exist across the battery's terminals even if the circuit connected to the battery is open? And the answer is yes. So, so the battery again is some mechanism that's designed to maintain a potential difference. It doesn't really matter to us how it does that, but essentially what it does is it moves charges around and so it keeps this nice potential difference. Now, what can we do with a capacitor? Well, here's a pretty simplified example of something we could do with a capacitor. So here I have a battery, a capacitor, and a light bulb. Uh, and so what I do is I can, and there's two switches. So switches are going to be important to us. Uh, so basically what that does is it makes this circuit kind of a dead circuit until I close uh, the, the little... Uh, uh, thing there. And so if I close that wire, right, what happens is, is my capacitor gets charged up just like we just talked about. So I can sort of close this switch, charge up my capacitor. Now it's a fully charged capacitor. Now this capacitor can serve as something that delivers charge to things. And so it can kind of act like a battery in a sense. And so what I can do is I can close that top switch and now uh, there's charges. And so this negative charge says, hey, I can go all the way around here and get back to the positive charge, right? That's an electrical circuit. Uh, and the thing is, while it does that, it lights up this light bulb. And so the charge would, would deplete from the capacitor, charge up, light the light bulb, uh, and then you would then sort of be back at the beginning. So this is an example of, of you know, this is uh, sort of how people used to do light bulb flashes. Uh, and you can say, well, why don't they just use the battery? Well, uh, the thing about capacitors, you can deliver the energy faster than a battery sometimes. And so it just is sort of advantageous to use a, a capacitor as opposed to a battery. Uh, now, the, the downside is it can't hold as much energy as a similar size battery, but it can generally deliver it uh, faster. And so... Uh, let's see. So a student asks, when the circuit is closed, is the light bulb just blink or it will shine for a while? So again, that kind of depends on the system, but obviously what you would want to do is you'd want to make it so that it uh, you know, shows a, a bright light. And so you would want to get sort of enough energy to come through. Now, uh, some examples of capacitors. So here is the thing, you know, you've seen this in, in uh, medical uh, TV shows where they want to get a shock across somebody's heart. And what this here is, is these are essentially two capacitor uh, to, uh, you know, different metal pieces of a capacitor. And, you know, in, in, the, in the TV shows, you hear it charging up. The bzzz, it's just the circuit we just described. It's like you're charging up this capacitor, and then you're sending a jolt through the person's heart. So you're having to charge, you know, kind of go through the heart from one uh, metal piece to the other. And again, the idea is, is that you can deliver uh, the electricity faster through the heart uh, than with the, the, you could with the size battery you'd have. So you need a much bigger battery in order to do the same, same effect. And so you can kind of do things a little bit more efficiently uh, with a capacitor. Um, there's also lots of, you know, sort of applications. So capacitors are, are ubiquitous in circuits. They're, they're really important. And, and actually right now there are people looking to, to use capacitors as, as a source to say in cars and things like that. Right, so right now, like most electric cars, use a lithium-ion battery. Uh, 
Um, and so people are looking into using what they call supercapacitors, basically just really big capacitors, uh, to power cars. And they already use them in some places to power trains and buses. Uh, so the advantage is it can be charged or discharged very quickly. So for instance, what we'll learn about later, uh, techniques you can do to actually charge this up when you're braking. Um, uh, the, the, the sort of the train or the bus that you're talking about. They also have a longer lifetime than a battery. They're a little bit safer. You know, they don't have chemicals in them that can uh, leak out and stuff. Uh, the big disadvantage is the capacitor is just two plates, which is fundamentally a two-dimensional object. And so it can't hold as much energy as a similar sized battery, which is a three-dimensional object. So that's the big sort of stumbling block, but people are looking into this and there's actually cars. Here's a, a race car that has a sort of super capacitor that uh, you can sort of turn on and give yourself an extra jolt of, of energy if you want to kind of get a turbo charge or something like that. So they're, they're already using these things, uh, but, but again, there's, there's lots of applications of capacitors. If you pull apart uh, some kind of a electronic device, you more than likely to find a, a capacitor inside. So here's our, our definition of, the, of capacitance. And capacitance is just a really fancy way of saying it's, it's our capacity to hold charge. So it's the ratio of the charge on one of your conductors uh, over the potential difference between the conductors. And so if you imagine, here's a capacitor and I'm hooking it up, you know, to some battery uh, that's got, and maybe again, I'll use my favorite one of 12 volts, right? And so the capacitance is how much charge you get on one of these plates divided by the potential. So it's charge per potential. And so basically, you know, you could imagine situations where you want a lot of charge or, or maybe whatever you want. You, you can sort of uh, determine how much charge by using different capacitors. The units is a farad, which we use F as the uh, way to approximate that. And so the larger the capacitance, the more charge can be stored uh, in a uh, potential difference. And uh, so someone asked, does capacitor have similar role as resistance? So no, it's, it's a different role, and we haven't even talked about resistance yet, so you're getting a little bit ahead of yourself. But yeah, but these are distinctly going to be different things than, than resistors. Um, and so here's our sort of definition of the parallel plate capacitor. So we've already, again, discussed the electric field of one of these. Um, and so here is our two plates. Um, and so the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor looks like this here. So it's this epsilon naught constant we've seen, and then it's the area of the plates divided by the distance of separation. So A is the area, and D is the distance of the separation. So if you actually have the geometry of your capacitor, you can tell what the capacitance of it is going to be. Um, and so, you know, what this says to us is that plates with more area have a bigger C. So hopefully that makes sense, uh, and the closer the plates are, we'll have a bigger capacitance too. And we'll sort of discuss that as we go along. Um, but basically, so the more area that we have, the bigger capacitance, and the closer the plates are, uh, the bigger capacitance. Okay, so, so usually people are pretty cool with the idea that bigger plates means you can collect more charge. Uh, but the idea that the difference, the separation distance, let's see if we can explore that a little bit more. So again, I'll set up here a capacitor with my uh, general 0 and 12. And so we know that this capacitor, if I hook it up to a battery, it's basically going to work itself out so it's got a voltage difference of 12 volts. And so let's remember uh, how our electric field, so the electric field magnitude... Uh, inside a capacitor goes as the change in the voltage over the change in the distance. And so I'll just call it X here, right? Uh, and so what happens is in this case here, let's suppose I was to bring these two plates closer together, right? Well, what would happen is the battery would work to maintain that voltage difference. So the voltage difference has to be the same, right? I mean, if this isn't 12 volts, charge will move until it is 12 volts. So that stays the same. And if I was to decrease this delta x, right, what would happen? Well, I'd increase my electric field. So we can sort of do it in the picture here. If I sort of decrease the distance, okay, bring them closer together, then what happens is I'll end up getting more charge. And, and so why is that? Well, if we look at this equation again, uh, so again, when I bring them closer together, this is still that that same 12 volts. So the, the battery will work to make this 12 volts again. It'll do that by adding more charge. And the reason is, is well, we know that if this distance goes down, the electric field goes up. And then we know our equation of electric field for inside a capacitor looks like this. It's the charge density divided by epsilon naught. So if the electric field inside that capacitor 
goes up, which it says over here it has to, the only way that can happen is by getting more charge. Um, and, and so that's what will happen here. And so, again, just the sort of rules. The closer the plates are, the larger the electric field, and the larger the electric field, uh, the more charge. And so that's why having it closer uh, it leads to more charge. Uh, so here someone asked, if there is no electrons flowing between the capacitors, how come when we bring the two plates closer, the capacitance gets larger? And again, when I bring them closer, okay, what will happen is the battery will move charge around in order to maintain this voltage difference. So you'd be, you'd be changing that voltage difference for a second, and then it'll move charge around to do that. Um, so yeah, so, so it's important to sort of know these rules, but also hopefully to understand a little bit about where they're coming from because uh, they are uh, tricky sometimes, I think. Uh, so let's look at an example. So a parallel plate capacitor initially has a potential difference of 400 volts and is then disconnected from the charging battery. If the plate spacing is now doubled, what is the new value of the voltage? So think about this one and we'll talk about it. Okay, so this is a tricky one. This is a, you know, a classic kind of quiz style question. So I get 800 volts. And so the, the trick here is that somewhere in this problem, me or the book, whoever is asking it, will let you know uh, which thing in the capacitor stays the same. So the two choices are the, the Q or the volts. And, and basically the way that it works is usually it'll be kind of hidden in there. But here it says it's disconnected from the charging battery. So if it's disconnected from the battery, okay, that means you've got this these two plates of like a negative Q and a positive Q. And if there's no battery, there's no mechanism to change the charge. And so if it's disconnected, then Q stays the same. And then the other option is the voltage stays the same. And that's the case where, you know, you're you're sort of adjusting the capacitor, like in that previous example we talked about. Um, where the battery is connected to it the, the whole time. And so if the battery is connected, then the battery will always adjust the voltage so the volts stay the same. And so basically, these kind of problems, it's your job to figure out which one is which. And so for us, this is the option here. Q stays the same for this example. Okay, so I'll say charge stays the same. And then let's go through and reason through this problem. So here's our sort of equation for capacitance. And so what we're saying here is the plate spacing is doubled. So D goes up. If D goes up, hopefully you see that C has to go down. So the capacitance of this capacitor is going to decrease. So here's my special capacitance equation. And what I can do is, is uh, and you'll have to do this sometimes, to sort of rearrange it for the thing that I'm interested in, which is the voltage, because we want to know what happens to the voltage in this particular case. And so here, if the C goes down, the voltage has to increase. And that's, of course, assuming that the Q stays the same. And so that's where this, you know, this sort of this question can, you know, have different responses depending on which one stays the same, depending on whether the voltage stays the same or the Q stays the same. So you've got to be real careful about whether it's disconnected or connected to the battery, essentially. And so the voltage goes up. And so since this is changed by a factor of two, the voltage goes up by a factor of two, which is what we get over here, 800. Uh, so that works. Now, another way to reason through it, there's usually two, you know, at least two ways to sort of think about this stuff, is again, the electric field inside our capacitor is sigma over epsilon naught. So we know that the charge stays the same, so that means the electric field inside our capacitor plates has to stay the same too, uh, whether we, no matter what we do to the capacitor. And so if I look at my, again, equation for electric field inside a capacitor, it's delta V over delta X. I know this has to stay the same. So if my delta X increases, my delta V has to increase by the same amount in order for that electric field in there to stay the same. So these are sort of two alternate ways to think about it. Um, you know, you can sort of pick which one you want, but the, the good news is there's always usually two ways to think about those. So we, we start out. I'm talking about capacitors, sort of simple ones, just to kind of get the basic idea down. Uh, but in real life, uh, it's advantageous to put uh, a dielectric uh, inside a capacitor. And, and a dielectric is just another fancy way of saying insulator. Um, and so basically, there's always a material inside your capacitor. And then what it does is in the equation, 
right? That material uh, involves a K constant. And here's the K constant. So a vacuum would be if nothing was there, so it's a 1. And then here's different kinds of materials. So like Teflon is 2. So it basically increases your capacitance by a factor of 2 if you fill it with Teflon. Uh, you know, different sorts of things like this thing here increases it by a factor of 110. So it, in general, you want a higher capacitance. And so you'll want to put the dielectric in. So in general, for us, this means that for most of our problems, or not most, but often, uh, there'll be some dielectric in there, and so you just got to sort of keep that in mind to find the right capacitance. Now let's see, to try to explain how this effect works. So for a dielectric and a capacitor, so electric field, uh, when the capacitor is charged, right? So, so we have an electric field, uh, and so our electric field, we've talked about this, but this is the electric field of the capacitor. So it's positive, it starts on the positives and points to the negatives, right? And our electric field, we've sort of discussed this uh, several times, inside a capacitor uh, has a nice sort of steady uh, delta x over, over, or delta v over delta distance, okay? Now what happens is when I put in the dielectric, it's, it's again an insulator, it's, it's going to polarize, right? The atoms in there are going to sort of work this way, where like the positive will be attracted to this negative over here, and the negative will be attracted to the positive, and the other one's repelled. Uh, and so what ends up happening is this is a big long line of these, but what will end up happening is the ones in the middle, these positive and negatives kind of cancel out. Uh, and you're left with sort of an overall negative here and an overall positive over here. And so this dielectric is going to make an electric field that kind of cancels out part of your electric field that was there already. Um, and so what that means is as your, your electric field uh, decreases uh, here, and so uh, in a sense, your, your voltage is decreasing. And so what this means is it means for the capacitor with the dielectric inside, uh, it allows the same charge to be held with a smaller potential. So you have the same charge there. Right? We didn't actually change the total charge that was on either side, uh, but we did that with a smaller um, voltage. And so, of course, our, our capacitance equation looks like this here. And so if it's a smaller voltage, uh, it's going to lead to a, a higher capacitance, right? So in this case here, by putting this in here, I've got the same Q, but for a, a, a sort of smaller voltage, and so I'll get a, a higher capacitance. So that's the sort of conceptual side of that. Uh, but again, it just most capacitors will have something put inside because it does increase the capacitance. So now we're going to look at when you have more than one capacitor. So the easier case is capacitors in parallel. And basically the way that they work is they work almost like they ignore the other capacitor. All right, and so when you, when you do this, you can sort of do the same sort of thing. So this bottom capacitor will charge up just the same way it did before. Uh, and again, the idea is if I have my favorite 12-volt battery, right, this thing will charge up until it's 0 and 12, right? Because again, if, if this thing is here and, and this other guy is, is, is less than 12, right, it's just going to keep moving charge until it is equal to 12. But then what will happen is the top one will charge itself too. And it essentially has the same access to the battery and so it's going to charge up until that same point so when it's 12 and it's zero and so what happens is capacitors in parallel the, the capacitors don't affect each other and the one thing that we're going to be interested in is sort of what we call the equivalent capacitance so when you have two capacitors the equivalent capacitance of the two capacitors is just adding the capacitance of them together all right, and you can kind of think about it as you can almost see here is this is sort of like just having one long capacitor where you've increased maybe the um, the surface area. So in this picture here, you can sort of say it's the same distance, and I just got sort of two longer surface areas, so I'm just going to increase the capacitance. Uh, and so you'll have problems that we'll get to later where like they will want to know, the book will, what is the equivalent capacitance of this group of, of capacitors, for instance. So the, the keys here is that the total charges increase. So we increase the capacitance so we can collect more charge than if we had just one of them. Uh, the potential difference is the same for the both. And then again, we can our equivalent capacitance is C1 plus C2. Now, capacitors in series uh, is this other case here. Uh, and, and maybe it'd be good just to backtrack a little bit and talk about parallel and series. Um, so, so basically my rule for something to be in parallel, so that's the first sort of thing, is, is what does it mean to be either parallel 
or a series. And so these two capacitors, you can draw a circuit diagram kind of like this. And to be in parallel, okay, it means I can go from one side of my item, okay, let's maybe change color here, one side of my item uh, to the other side without touching anything else but wires. So I can totally do that here. And then over here, I can go from the other side to the other side of the object without touching anything from wires. And so that's my definition of parallel. you got to be careful because very often uh, the picture can be deceiving. Um, so now we're going to go into series, and series works sort of uh, this way. And so if I've got two objects, so here's two capacitors in series. And the way that this works, my sort of rule, just to make sure, is that series works that if I go through the first one, I have no other choice but to go through the second one. That's series. We're going to get really good at these things over the next couple of weeks. Um, so good to define those. So capacitors in series. So this time the capacitors will affect each other. And we can kind of talk about it conceptually. What's going to happen is the same thing happened before. So if I hook this up like this, they're in series. Again, if I go through one, I have to go through the other one. What will happen is an electron from here will say, hey, I can go over to this positive side. So that's nice. Um, and then that positive will attract a negative from this plate to sort of go from there to there leaving a positive behind, which will then attract a negative from the battery to come over to there. And so we'll see that what happens in this case is the charges on the two sheets are all correlated. And so they'll basically charge up, and they'll charge up to a point where the charges on them are all the same. Like you've got the same positive on this side and the same negative on that side. Um, and so uh, that's how that charging process will work. So the charge must be equal. That's a key point for in series. Uh, and the potential difference of the capacitors will add up to that of the battery. And so let's just say that this is my good old friend 0 and 12. And let's say these are identical capacitors. Well, again, we know that, that once this capacitor reaches 0 volts, then there's no advantage for the charges to move over here anymore. And so this one will be 0 volts. And over here, we know that basically this is 12 volts because then there's no advantage to move back and forth. The middle part is a little bit tricky, but the thing is we know that basically this whole thing has to be the same voltage. And so this will work out again. Uh, here I'm doing it where these are equal, uh, so that like this one is like from 0 to 6 volts, and this is 6 to 12. Uh, and so what this is, the potential difference of capacitors adds up to that of the battery. So there's a potential difference here of 6, and here of 6, and those add up together to be the potential difference of the battery. Um, and then we're going to find that the, to get the equivalent capacitance, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, it's this situation here, uh, this sort of addition of capacitors right here. And so we can summarize all of this information on this chart here. And so you basically uh, will be able to, to find it useful if something is either in series or parallel. Here's the equation to find the equivalent capacitances. Uh, and here's the information about the voltage and the charge. The voltage for parallel is the same. That's going to be key. And the charge for series is the same. And then the other two add up to be what the equivalent is. We're going to go through now and sort of do some examples of this in practice. Uh, and again, just my, our, my rule for, for parallel, right? For parallel, I can go from the top to the top of one of them without touching anything else and the bottom to the bottom of something else without touching anything else. And the same thing, C1, I can go all the way to the top of C3, and I go from the bottom of C1 to the bottom of C3 without touching anything else. So all three of these are in parallel. So you can do more than two, you just add another term to your, your equations down here. And then over here, these three are all in series. If I go through this one, I have no choice but to go through that one, and then no choice but to go through that one if I keep moving forward. And so those are in series. And a couple of questions from students here. Uh, so can capacitors be in parallel and in series? And how will calculations work in that case? So they can't be in both. It's either one or the other, but you will find it where there's capacitors that aren't in either. And that's the more common case. And so if that's true, then you can't do anything. So usually with these problems, there's sort of two that are either in parallel or series right away, and you kind of have to start with those. Uh, so we, we'll get sort of better at this.
And then if, if two capacitors are in parallel, can they be considered effectively as, as one capacitor? Well, that's sort of the idea. So these equations, these equivalent equations, will allow us to sort of combine capacitors. And then, yes, basically then we sort of can see their effect of both of them combined into one. And so that, here's a good example uh, to start this off. So we're going to do a lots of practice with this over the next couple of weeks. And it's like little Sudoku puzzles. So hopefully uh, you'll, you'll see. And, and uh, I think it's the kind of thing that when you first see it, it's kind of like, whoa, what are you talking about? But then after you do some, I think most people get really good at this sort of thing. Um, so let's look at this. Find the equivalent capacitance of these capacitors. So if you want to stop and try this, go ahead. And if not, I'll talk about it in a second. Okay, so here, the equivalent capacitance of these capacitors, uh, when I figured it out, I got six microfarads. So let's go through and sort of think about how to do this. So hopefully you, you got a, 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 an attempt at trying it. And, and basically, the, the thing about this uh, is that, again, you've got to know where to start. And so here, the six and the 12 are in parallel with each other. Okay, and how do I know that? Well, again, it's, it's that trick where I can go, if, if you look over here, I can go from the bottom of the 6 to the bottom of the 12 without touching anything else. And I can go from the top of the 6 to the top of the 12 without touching anything else. So those are definitely in parallel. Now, uh, you might think, well, aren't the 9 and the 6 in series? Well, if I go through the 9, I have a choice. I could sort of take this path through the 6 or this path through the 12. So the 9 isn't anything with the other ones right now. So in this case, you have to start with the 6 and the 12. And so if I do that, uh, and what I like to do is I like to draw sort of a separate diagram. So this is the kind of thing that if you once you get good at it, you might start skipping. But I still think it's really key to do this. But uh, So 30 volts, the way you do this is you sort of combine. So I'm going to combine these two guys into one. And so here I have this 9... Uh, microfarads and I combine this one over here well the thing is when you're in parallel you just add them so that's I'm going to write down that equation uh, so when I do that so now I've got a, a circuit with a 9 and an 18 and hopefully you can see now that these guys uh, are in, in parallel or are in series okay so if I go through the 9 and I keep going I have no choice but to go through the 18 so the next uh, thing we do is we just sort of write the circuit again and now we've broken it down into what I like to call the simplest circuit in the world one battery and, and one element and so to find this out we use this other uh, equation which again is a little bit trickier it takes a little maybe a little time to get used to and so 1 over 9 farads plus 1 over 18 microfarads now what you can do is get kind of slick with this and so let's get a common denominator so here would be 2 over 18 microfarads plus 1 over 18 right when I do that I get 3 over 18 microfarads and then what I do is I invert both equations so I get C equivalent equals 18 microfarads divided by 3 which is 6 microfarads and so now I have this circuit which is again one battery one element and so the equivalent capacitance is 6 microfarads so in this circuit right that 30 volt battery essentially sees you know it's sort of being influenced by uh, a capacitor of six microfarads and the thing is this will generally be our first step into interpreting these different circuits so it's an, it's an important place to start an important thing to sort of get uh, get good at all right so next we're going to in again interpret this circuit so generally these problems work you know like the first part will ask you what is the equivalent capacitance and then the second part will ask uh, something more in depth and this is that so what is the voltage across the six microfarad capacitor so this guy right here so why don't you give that a go see if you can think about that and then we'll talk about it okay so when I did this I got 10 volts so let's go through and, and sort of figure out how to approach this uh, so so the way that I look at this is I immediately go back to the pictures that I had before uh, and use those and so this is why it's sort of key to have those pictures. And so I start with this case over here, the simplest circuit in the world. And so what I do is I make a little chart here. So I start with the, the capacitor of the six, that first one, that equivalent one. And the thing is, when it's one battery and one capacitor, it's really easy. You can find all this stuff right away. I know that that capacitor, uh, when once it's fully charged, that equivalent one will have a, a voltage of 30 volts. And so then my next part is to figure out the charge. And so what I do is I take...
my equation. And so our equation is C equals QV, and I sort of rearrange it to solve for what I want. And so I want to find Q, so that's C times V. So in this case, it's 6 microfarads times a voltage of 30. And so when I calculate that, I get 180 microcoulombs. So my charge on that is 180 microcoulombs. So I start with this first one, and then what I call it is sort of unpacking. So I unpack that 6, and when I unpack it, if you remember from last time, I had a 9 and an 18. And so over here I write down the 9 and the 18. And the thing is, is when you unpack them, one of these things, the Q or the delta V, will always stay the same. And that's the big tricky part here. So here I'm unpacking 2 in series, if you go back and look at our chart, the thing that stays the same on your capacitors when they're in series is the charge. And so you literally just write the 180 from this part over to both of these guys. And then what you do is you rearrange our capacitor equation in terms of the voltage. So the voltage is Q divided by C. And so for one of those, I take the C of 180 microcoulombs. And let's just pick the 9 microfarads. The micro part cancels, that's nice, and I get 20 volts. So for the 9, I get 20 volts. Uh, if you do the other one with the 18, you get 10 volts. Uh, and so note here, so uh, the thing about this that we also talked about is that these two charges should add, or these two voltages should add up to be that voltage. And indeed they do. So that's a good way to kind of check yourself. And so then the last part of this is to unpack uh, the 18. So we're un un packing that into the 6 and the 12. And so I write down the 6 and the 12. The other good news is if, you know, this question happened to be about the 9, well then you're done because you just figured out all the 9's information over here. Uh, our question was depending on this 6, so I got to go a little bit further. So these are in parallel. When I unfold or unpack things in, in parallel, the voltage is what's the same for the two of them. So the 18, the voltage for the 18 will be the same for these two other guys. So 10 volts and 10 volts. This is actually what I was asking. So in a sense, we're done with the further, the, the last problem, but might as well uh, continue on and, and figure out the rest of this chart. So the charges on the 6 and the 12, you can find using this equation. And for instance, for the charge on the 6, I get 6 microfarads times, again, the voltage is 10 volts for that guy. And so I'd get 60 microcoulombs of charge. So if I do that, I get 60 there. But the same for this guy, I get 120. And again, we see this uh, this thing is just sort of a way to check yourself. So like over here, we saw that the, the, the 20 and the 10 have to add up to the 30. Well, the same token, the 60 and the 120 have to add up to the 180. And, and they do. And so it's a way to kind of check yourself. And so we basically solved everything there is to solve for for this particular uh, circuit right now. And the last thing we'll, we'll uh, talk about today is the stored energy in a capacitor. So hopefully you've seen that we can charge up a capacitor, then we can use that to, you know, power things or do different things, and so there's amount of energy there. So how do we figure this out? Well, you can do it in a couple of different ways. Here's, here's one approach. Uh, and so basically you can think about charging up your capacitor. So uh, that first electron that moves over, right? So again, we talked about this. So what's happening is the electron moves over to here, it's happy there, uh, then an electron is moved over to here, uh, and essentially, again, we can think about it as the electron is sort of jumping from here to here. And so for each one of these that happens, we can kind of think about it as a calculation. And so the first electron, when it jumps, there's no potential difference between these plates. They're just sitting there, there's no potential difference. And so the work done, right, which our equation is Q delta V, would just be zero. So the first electron sort of costs us nothing. Uh, then a whole bunch of them uh, line up, and then the last electron, right, is going to be the, the charge of our electron times the, the, the potential difference, and this is the total potential difference of the capacitor, right? One little piece of charge is basically insignificant, and so when it's the last one, this thing is essentially fully charged, and so you get the, the work at the end is, is QV. And then you just sort of in your head think, well, you know, basically the potential is increasing steadily as I do that. And so you can make this uh, assumption that then, well, the work for average is one half Q times V. And so that gives us this equation that our potential that's stored in the capacitor is one half uh, Q times V. Now you can also think about this uh, in terms of uh, taking an integral. 
And so what you can do is, is, is look at it here and say, okay, I, I want to find the work done by charging this Q uh, across this potential uh, dV. And of course we know that Q for us is equal to C times V. And so I can make that uh, CV dV into here. Uh, and, and we'll say this is the same capacitor, so it's a nice constant. And so I pull that out. So I get C, and I'm going to have V dV. And essentially we're integrating from zero to my total voltage. And so if I do this integral, right, I'm going to get C times one half V squared, evaluated from zero to V total. And so when I do that, I get one half CV squared. So another way to kind of think about it, and the thing is, uh, what you're going to find is that with these uh, energy equations, right? So, so basically, this is calculating the work done, and so this will be the the uh, potential energy uh, once you're done with that. And the thing is, you can just plug in these these values to get different versions of this. So here, I can say, well, I know that C is equal to Q divided by V, and plug that in over here. So I get one half. Q divided by V times Q squared, and I get this equation, one-half QV. We're going to find that in most of these problems, it's super key which one of these equations you end up dealing with. And so again, you can substitute, you get one-half QV, one-half CV squared, and one-half Q squared divided by C. Uh, and basically, we'll, we'll talk more about this, but you, you know, depending on which one you have, you can usually get to the answer a little bit faster.